So, hi everyone, nice to meet you again to a new interview from the series Behind, uh, Beyond the Cancer Diagnosis, today with uh, Camille, a cancer survivor, which is joining today to tell uh, us her, uh, her story, her uh, wonderful story I can, I can tell. Hello Camille, and nice to, to meet you and uh, thank you for uh, agreeing with our invitation. Yes, thank you so much. I'm honored to um, be interviewed and appreciate your time. And um, and I'm happy to be able to share some hope, hopefully, for patients. Uh, before we we enter um, uh, in the uh, discussions regarding hopes and fears and all the facts, I will uh, start with the first question, which is related more about the, the medical, let's say, issues. Sure. Uh, you uh, you've uh, experienced um, uh, something that uh, would be quite difficult for any one of us an initial diagnosis uh, with poor prognosis mm -hmm. but uh, you didn't give up and you search uh, for a second opinion which it seems to be totally different from the first one so uh, my question is, uh, how important is searching or looking after second opinion in uh, cancer prognosis? Um, I would say it's vital because uh, if you, with pancreatic cancer, you have to be in either an NCI designated cancer center or a cancer center that is doing, you know, an oncologist that that's all he's seeing is GI and pancreas cancer, because without their expertise, um, it, you're you're going to get a poor prognosis and probably a poor outcome. So it's vital because I had an oncologist that you know had studied in uh, pancreatic cancer, and his first opinion of me was, "Don't do chemo; it was too late." And I was really full of cancer. By the time I was diagnosed, my whole liver was full. So it was in the tail of pancreas, and the liver was completely full, um, which caused pain that brought me to the ER to get a scan. So once I was diagnosed and I had that horrible prognosis, um, we immediately got a second opinion. And um, we were very lucky to get a second opinion like as soon as I was released from the hospital where I was diagnosed. And uh, we went in there with this horrible news. And from the moment that that oncologist, um, he's in North Carolina now, Dr. Rocha Lima, walked in um, with his team, Jessica and Terry, who I'm now, you know, very, very close with, obviously. And um, from the moment they walked in, they were like, I, you know, I was crying. I told them, you know, what he said. And they were like, no, no, no who he's not God. This is what we're going to do. We're going to treat you. You're going to have quality of life and it's going to work as long as your body can handle this. And I, they immediately um, asked me all the questions like that, that had been going on little by little that built up to it. Like, did you have this? Was this going on? It just all made sense. And I honestly, from the moment I met that team, I felt this overall um, energy that I felt in my heart. They're gonna, they're gonna help me, and um, if I have the best chance possible. Of course, I didn't know that I would be here twelve years later, which is chemotherapy. But I knew I had the best hope, and at first, I was just buying three months at a time. So to me, the second opinion, you know, I have patients from all over reaching out and they're told, yeah, you have six months or you have eight months because they're being seen by an oncologist that maybe does pancreatic breast cancer. They're a general oncologist. So to me, uh, my message is always, you need to get to a pancreatic oncologist that that's all he sees, that's all he's doing and that he's in the lab. You know, uh, he's actually doing research. So um, that's the, is just so vitally important because I know that I have an oncologist that should anything go wrong, he's going to be there for me and he's going to seek out whatever I'm going to need going forward. So, 
Uh, I ask uh, you this because uh, many cancer patients didn't ask for second opinion from uh, different uh, reasons. And right. uh, uh, it depends very much also on the uh, medical uh, staff or medical uh, entity because some of them uh, forced you to go to for the second opinion and uh, some of them uh, like don't let you go. They say, why you have to go to, to search for the second opinion when this is the reality? But Unfortunately, right. Mm -hmm. but please. Yeah. No, that's like kind of goes into ego of doctors. Like, yeah. you know, like, well, I, I'm already telling you there's no hope. What are you going to him for? So exactly. And um, it, it, to me, a positive oncology team I have to say was a huge benefit. It, it was, it, it, it's the reason I'm here because they never, they made me think of cancer as normal, as a chronic disease. They didn't make me look at it as like I was going to die. Uh, when I would go to chemo, some of the nurses would say, oh yeah, this is a chronic disease. And you know, those words change how you think. And my oncologist they were, I knew he was the best in my heart. And um, we just, we, we bonded so much that, you know, my nurse is now we're very close. I've done a lot of panels with her at medical conferences and I've, we've been able, we now share a lot more time uh, promoting and bringing awareness and, and uh, I'm part of the survivorship program now. So then we did in clinic. You know, so it's very, very rewarding this, now. This is the first step in getting better to have an empathy with the medical staff and to to receive from them trust and hope. This is, I guess, the most important things. And uh, now we are talking um, about survivorships, uh, and uh, you are now a survivor. And uh, in uh, this field of oncology and psycho-oncology, we are talking uh, often about coping strategies. How do you cope with cancer care? Uh, can you tell us, did, do you use uh, coping strategies? And if yes, which ones was uh, or were the best for you? Right. So, I... Coping strategies in terms of activities, hobbies uh, that you've done and uh, make you feel better um i we did a lot of family time we did a lot of staycations um every three months i always had a goal to travel i live in south florida so we would go to new york where i grew up and my daughter and i always had um a plan to go somewhere so even though i might have been sick and ill we would check into a hotel let people come visit us so being around family and friends became very important that time that we, you know, real quality time spent with family. And um, for me, I visualized, I visualized myself every single day. I looked in, I would close my eyes and just really concentrate on the future. And in the future, I would be well and I would be healthy. So um, I really, you know, um, when I was the sickest and laying on the sofa, I would see myself walking in New York because New York was always energy. It's a, you know, everybody wants to go to yeah. New York. Um, and never sleeps. Yeah. Hmm? Right. That's exactly. And, it, and, never city, and I grew up there. So, it, you know, I have a lot of memories of different areas because I was there with my parents and, you know, uh, the stores have memories. So I, um, I spent, we, we'd go there and, um, you know, just kind of fill up on the energy of the city. We always had a trip plan. Um, and when I was six, so I would see myself walking around the city, I'd see myself and then I did it in a few months. You understand? Like, I really believed that I was going to do it. I spent when I had my pump on, cause that was on for 48 hours. I spent time very kind of in a very relaxed state in my house with my dogs. And I would sort of chant, um, to the cancer, to the chemo 
kill the cancer cells, kill the cancer cells, kill the cancer cells. And I would tell the cancer, get out of my body, stop interfering with my life, get out of my body, get out of my body. Um, I used art therapy, just working on art projects, especially once I developed neuropathy and my hands were in pain and hurt. Uh, there was, you know, I couldn't button and things. So I focused on trying to make my hands do things they didn't want to do. Like, and um, I'd used a lot of uh, art projects, music, of course, listening to music. Um, and uh, I think um, diversion, I never discussed with my friends. We never talked about cancer. We always talked about where we were going, whether we were going to a food and wine event, where we were going to dinner, where we were, you know, never... Um, I didn't talk about it because it, um, I never let it steal my spirit. I couldn't let it take away who I was. Like when I went to chemo, I went to chemo all dressed up. I went to people would come and see me in my house and I was all dressed up. I never, um, let it like, um, interfere. Um, I, I just kept living my life. I thought in the beginning that I was going to do chemo the rest of my life. So right away I accepted it. And I had gratitude I was alive and I learned to manage side effects because I thought I was going to do it forever. And then, you know, one day when my doctor said, hey, we're going to give you a two month holiday. That was after 17 months chemo. Uh, thankfully, my holiday is I'm still on it. I'm still <laughs> celebrating no chemo. So I'm still on my holiday. So um, once I, you know, so there you go. So the um, uh, I just. I believed completely with every part of my body in my doctor only. I never listened to outside sources. I wouldn't let people tell me, oh, take this vitamin, do this supplement. No, I only listened to my team. And, you know, you, my you team. Know, you, you know your body, you know your interior force so uh, that's and that's and i knew i also knew that my chemo was working because every three months we saw it shrinking and going away therefore i wouldn't jeopardize taking anything someone would because it was working why would i do anything to make it not work when i knew it was working so i and i would tell people i have the best doctor in the whole world don't you know i would get very like, no, you know, um, because unfortunately when you get cancer, everyone wants to tell you how to cure it. Like, you know, oh, don't eat this, do this. They don't know what they're talking about. But yeah. so the, the, I, the, 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 there is a principle in psych oncology that uh, uh, say that uh, you, uh, when you want to help, you make it worse. So uh, let each right. patient live how how they choose like for me a lot of patients want to find other patients and connect when i was in chemo i didn't i needed to be in my circle and we sort of huddled in and you know um we did everything obviously we were out and about and enjoying life as much as we could but not i just didn't um i didn't ever compare myself because Honestly, when I was diagnosed, all I ever knew of cancer was it was really bad and most people passed away, especially with pancreatic. So I was, um, I had to separate, you know, I knew I was, um, I knew everyone was different and I knew I, that I knew for some reason deep down, um, I thought I was going to be okay. I kept thinking this is temporary. <laughs> Um, so I sort of forced myself to believe it was temporary and thank goodness, you know, I'm here 12 years later and I, I had pretty much the most devastating diagnosis you can get. You mentioned about the, the family support and uh, statistics prove that uh, family support is uh, half of recovery. Um, in uh, your case, it seems that uh, it worked. Uh, mm -hmm. family supports, but uh, uh, you told me that now you are doing a panel and talking with uh, cancer patients. What uh, is your, uh, your opinion on cancer patients who are, don't have a family support? What can you yeah. tell them? Because uh, this uh, make, uh, make it uh, harder. I've, I've met patients, unfortunately I met a man 
um, who was battling stage four pancreatic cancer and his family already counted him out. They didn't, they didn't go to the doc. I, it was breaking my heart listening to this story that they didn't seem engaged anymore. They felt like it's pancreatic. You know, it has the worst prognosis and it has the worst reputation. You know, people would look at me and go, oh, I'm so sorry. And, you know, I'd say, no, no, no. Don't go to my funeral before I'm there. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so, um, so uh, there, I would recommend, you know, obviously an oncology therapist, because I think it's very important that it is a, a oncology therapist, not a regular therapist. They're really not qualified. Onco you know, when, once you have cancer, you have to have people who are trained in oncology. You need oncology nurses, oncologists, oncology therapists. Um, you just need that extra level of, of expertise. So um, therefore, I um, um, oh, kind of lost my train of thought there for a second. I'm sorry. Um, the, the family support was huge for me. Um, in the case where you don't get that support, I would say to try support groups. I'm not personally a fan of them because I find them to be sad. And um, and like I said, my way to get through it was diversion. I always had a plan to do something, go somewhere. Um, I didn't want to sit around and talk about this is what I'm going through. We didn't talk about it because part of me felt if I don't get ready to die, I won't yeah. get it. Yeah. And I know a lot of people who they go, oh, I wrote letters to my family members and they're already planning their funeral and what kind of music and who they want to speak. And I'm like, no, I'm fighting to live. I'm not, that, I can't think, I can't, Put, project that in my mind. I had to project in my mind healing. You're going to get better. You have the best doctor. You have the best chance. You can do it. You can do it. You've been through stuff. You can do this. Uh, talking with you now, uh, I'm seeing that uh, you are talking um, uh, a lot of present, of today, of the moment, of as we speak, uh, uh, philosophically, uh, speaking, uh, uh, the ancient uh, Greek philosopher Aristotle uh, said that uh, present is something very thin. It's like a thin line between past and future. Uh, what is present for you now? Because it seems to me that present, it's, it's, a, it's a big thing uh, for you. It's not a thin line. It's something that you really live... Uh -huh in every moment. Right. Here's the thing. Um, you know, my prognosis and pancreatic cancer, you never know what's going to happen. I'm very blessed to be where I am. Therefore, I, I'm, I'm present because I think about a lot of times when I'm at something really important, like on a panel for cancer or on the news or something, I'm sitting there thinking, I could have missed this. If I listened to that first doctor, if I, you know, if I didn't get that second opinion. So I, at moments, I feel very surreal in present moments because I look around and I think, wow, look at where I am. Um, so, and I'm very, you know, I, um, I don't think about the past that much. Like I know I went through a lot, but I've just moved so forward in it and it's really brought me a new purpose in life cancer. Um, so I don't look at it as crazy as it sounds. I don't look at it as so bad thing because it did bring me a whole new purpose of gave me a new mission. And now I'm helping patients globally. And, you know, I'm able to share and show them that, you know, getting the right doctor, the right team, believing in your team, I think that is half the battle. Um, and, you know, and just listening to him, I know so many people who, even though they're doing well, they're still looking for something else. I knew I had, I knew I had the diamond in my hand. I wasn't going to I wasn't like the moment and enjoy 
Every right. Time. And and we should all be living that way because I've learned and seen people since I've been diagnosed die of young of heart attacks, falling downstairs. So we never know what's going to happen. So if we're not enjoying today, I try to be present. You know, I used to be like everybody else worrying about this and that. And now I'm more enjoying, even when I'm driving my car down the road, sometimes I'll go like, not, you know, look at the trees are beautiful. The, this is beautiful. Like, like, like I just see, I see beauty everywhere. I don't have to be somewhere fancy. I can go outside. I have a, a garden with pineapples growing. I, it, I have a lot of joy in my life. You are the perfect example of what uh, uh, Marcus Aurelius, the, the Roman emperor said that each morning when we wake up, we should enjoy life, be grateful that we see the sun, we see people, we we can do things. So you are the perfect example of enjoying life, enjoying the moment. And uh, this um, uh, goes uh, to the next question that uh, I want to ask you, also starting from, uh, from a very nice quote that I, 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 I really love it. There is a Brazilian writer, uh, Fernando Sabino, uh, who uh, wrote very beautiful. In the end, everything will be okay. If it's not okay, it's not the end. I guess it's apply very, very good in your case because it wasn't okay. So that means that it wasn't uh, yet over. So. Well, well, I had never seen that until you sent me the question. And I, it, number one, my doctor was is Brazilian. <laughs> so kind of like all like, like, it, 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 Yes. And um, it's very, um, exactly the, um, out of the worst thing that I could have happened to me came really the best life um and really living life a real life like before i think you know you're just like everyone else and now i feel a whole like different way of living and and definitely um uh it's just uh i don't know it's hard to um explain uh the the like the, just the joy of waking up, the joy of driving a car. Um, there was a time when I was very sick and I could barely walk around my house. And so me driving, being alone in the car, you know, no one has to drive me, having my hair, having, um, knowing that I can go shopping and go wherever. And so I, I feel very empowered now um, in a different way, like, because you just appreciate everything around you. It is also another quote that uh, I liked, uh, which said that uh, we have two lives. The second begins when we realize that we have only one. So, wow. yeah, that's, 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 that's the case. profound, yes. Because, you know, um, here's the thing. When I was, I had been praying for a new job and I was praying really hard. I wanted a new job. And then I was diagnosed and, you know, I went through all my chemo and everything. And then once I came out of that, my nurse encouraged me to tell my story. Well, you know, cancer was always like a scary thing to talk about before, but now that I was on this other side of it, it, be, you know, once I told my story, I realized, oh my God, there's an audience. People want to hear a story like this. They, 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 they love it. So, um, it, I realized that, wow, you know, it is important to share. Um, because it's I'm, the power of the example, you know, and people uh, search uh, the power of example. Mm -hmm. People right. who said that, look at me, I, I could do it. Mm -hmm. So plus like when I was saying, I was, I was praying for a job, I got diagnosed, I went through cancer. And then I feel like I was given a job, but it might have not been the job I prayed for. You understand? <laughs> but out of it, I became a patient advocate. I became this survivorship 
that people can go to in their worst moment and, you know, I can help them or, you know, help facilitate that they get a second opinion or, or be there on the day that they're having that hard time and going through the treatment. And, you know, I was just talking to a man the other day, you know, and I was like, listen, there is no exhaustion like chemo exhaustion. So remember that and, you know, be kind to yourself, you know? Um, so it, it's, you know, it's rewarding for me because I can be there now for others. Kindness, uh, it's a good thing, but not all of us really understand what it really means to be kind with the other. And uh, I guess this is a problem of, of the modern society. We are not kind with each other anymore. And uh, uh, when you are uh, sick uh, with cancer, other disease, people uh, feel you vulnerable. Instead, right. instead of showing you kindness. So when, when you, you find someone, that, uh, that, that is better. And uh, you've told me before our interview that you want to thank somebody in particular yeah. uh, oh. today, and now you have the chance Wonderful. to well, a person or a team that were very kind with you. Okay. Um, well, I would like to thank um, Dr. Rosha Lima, Jessica McIntyre, Terry Pollack, those three were my team that were there. Dr. Rochalima came up with my treatment plan. Um, Jessica and Terry were there supporting me the, throughout my um, whole cancer treatment. Um, there was meltdowns along the way, you know, things like that. And they were always there, always cheering me on and uh, lifting me up. And then um, they... Um, I just I have a bond with them. And then it was Jessica, my nurse, who in the very beginning encouraged me to share my story, which my story has catapulted. I've been able to help patients worldwide um, with her encouragement. So I can, you know, say thank you to Jessica and Dr. Roshan Lima and Terry Pollack. And of course, Dr. Neimer, who runs the cancer center here in Miami, Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center, where um, we are an NCI designated cancer center. And we are so, I'm so fortunate that I have them. And I know that God forbid I ever need them, they're gonna be there for me. Uh, we are uh, running uh, out of time and I have one, uh, one uh, question for you. Uh, if you can describe in one word uh, all this experience uh, to help it, the others, which will be? Hope? Um, Maybe. Well, you mean to describe what I give others? Yes. Oh, hope. hope. Number one, hope. Number one, it's all about the hope. Um, and I change, I know that after I speak with patients, I know I change their mindset because I explain what I did. And then they start to write it down and, and rely on it and call me or text me and let me know, oh, today this happened or that happened. And then I love hearing when they tell me my skin was good. I, you know, and, you know, and I get their feedback and, or that, you know, like they, or sometimes, you know, chemo will beat you up and they're really down. And it's so for me, I know I bring them hope, but it's rewarding for me that when I hang up, I know they feel better. Like I, I can feel, I could see their shift in energy when they hang up. So you inspire them. Exactly. Right. Right. That's that's great. Thank you, Camille, for being with us today. Thank you for your story, uh, for your uh, uh, inspired things that you said, for your kindness and for your hope that you are giving to to each of the person you met. Thank, Thank you very you. much. And uh, what can I wish you that? Uh, enjoy life future i just want to stay stable and healthy that's all i care about <laughs> okay